Hello, my name is Dr. Joseph Sassine. I'm a professor here at the University of Colorado Skag School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. And today I want to talk a little bit about the new hypertension guidelines that were published in 2013. In 2003, the JNCA guidelines were published, and these were NHLBI sponsored guidelines. They routinely had updated these guidelines, with the most recent version being 10 years ago in 2003. And NHLBI did commit to updating these guidelines for them intended to be called the JNC-8. They worked on them for several years, but they did notice throughout the deliberations by their expert panels that they were lacking a lot of consensus on exact recommendations. So it took a while to actually get these published. However, there's a twist. These guidelines are now published as a JNC-8 report. They are not viewed as NHLBI sponsored guidelines. NHLBI actually pulled the plug on publishing them as guidelines and actually allowed the writing group to go on their own and publish their own recommendations, which we now view as the JNC 8 report. Um, I don't call this a guideline, I call it the JNC 8 report, which was written by the expert panel originally appointed to that committee. That was first released in December of 2013. Right about the same time, actually a day before the JNC-8 got released, we had the American Society of Hypertension, who teamed up with the International Society of Hypertension. They published a clinical practice guideline for hypertension one day prior. So what we have in the year 2013 are two publications, one being the JNC-8 report, which isn't quite a full guideline, and then we have the ASH, which is American Society of Hypertension, in collaboration with the International Society of Hypertension guidelines, published the same year, December 2013. So for the JNC-8 report, they intended on developing an evidence-based guideline. And even though they don't have that final call of being referred to as a guideline, they are an evidence-based report that makes very clear recommendations on three questions. When to treat hypertension, how tightly to control hypertension, and what to treat with. They chose an evidence-based approach looking at very high-level evidence, randomized controlled trials primarily, to support answering and making recommendations for those three questions. The ASH guidelines, the American Society of Hypertension guidelines, aren't quite an exhaustive evidence-based guideline report. They're more of a clinical practice guideline. They don't rank their recommendations like the JNC-8 report does, but it still adds valuable information. So what clinicians really need to deal with, especially pharmacists, are how do these two reports, one being a guideline, one being the JNC-8 report, how do they complement each other and how are they different from each other? So first, I think it's really important to recognize that both publications strongly advocate for controlling and treating hypertension as a primary evidence-based strategy to reduce the burden of cardiovascular disease. That's the overall global similarity. Some other similarities that they have is that they advocate for, in general, for most patients, a similar blood pressure goal, which is less than 140 over 90. They also similarly advocate for using evidence-based treatments in which we have four primary drug classes. We have angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. We call them ACE inhibitors. We have angiotensin receptor blockers. We call them ARBs. We have calcium channel blockers, and we also have diuretics as the four drug classes, which are the primary evidence-based treatments for treating most patients with hypertension. There are some subtle differences within these two reports. They both actually use an approach which appreciates age and also race in choosing from that list of four which one's most appropriate for your patient. So in general, for African-American patients, we see a preference when selecting first therapy of using either a calcium channel blocker or a diuretic. This is in contrast to non-African American patients who are below the age of 60, where ACE inhibitors and, or ARBs are recommended as first therapy. In patients who are 60 years of age or older, in general, we resort to the African American recommendations, which are for first therapy, either a diuretic or a calcium channel blocker. Where some of the differences lie and where actually people are highly debating are the exact blood pressure values. So as I said previously, the general blood pressure recommendation, which is different than in the past. In the past, we had blood pressure goals of less than 130 for some people, like with diabetes and kidney disease, then less than 140 over 90 for other populations. Um, both guidelines in general don't support that very low blood pressure goal. They state that a general goal of 140 over 90 less than that being the general target for the global population. They do differ though in the population where they recommend a higher blood pressure goal, which is less than 150 over 90. The JNC-8 report, based on raw evidence, very high level evidence, the best available evidence, sticks to their stance that that blood pressure goal 
for anybody who's 60 or older should be less than 150 over 90. The ASH guidelines actually increase that age cutoff point to 80. So they state everybody under 80 should be treated to less than 140 over 90, but when you get 80 and above, the ASH guidelines say that's when you should implement that less than 150 over 90. That's been the biggest debate. So the discrepancy in patients between the age of 60 and 79, where the JNC8 says lower the goal to 150 over 90, but the ASH guidelines say maintain that 140 over 90. That's created a lot of controversy and it's created perhaps some confusion amongst the medical community, the pharmacy community, and even the patient community. And they're interpreting that based on the recommendations from the JNC8 report where patients between the age of 60 and 79, they recommend raising that blood pressure goal to 150 over 90. That's very much a bone of contention because other major organizations have published guidelines, guidelines from Canada, the UK, the American Diabetes Association, and even the ASH guidelines where they don't agree with that. They stick to the systolic number of 140 and not raising it to 150. So when treating a patient who's 68 years of age, that highlights the controversy between these two guidelines. I think clinicians have to choose one direction or another to go in. So personally, my recommendation, um, the ASH guidelines published in 2013, the same year that the JNC8 report was published, they would state for that patient to have a blood pressure goal of less than 140 over 90. That's the blood pressure goal that we've been using for years. We have good outcomes with cardiovascular health with that overall treatment approach. So in my personal practice, I still advocate for less than 140 over 90. However, I do recognize the JNC8 report recommends 150 over 90. And that is one that you need to take, I wouldn't say with a grain of salt, but you need to make it patient-centered. So there may be a, that 68-year-old patient, if they're very frail, if they have a history of falling, if they're sensitive to medications, that would be a reason, in my per opinion, to actually consider their recommendations and going to the higher goal. Absent a good reason, I still would target less than 140 over 90 in that type of individual, assuming they're healthy and able to have a blood pressure less than 140 over 90. Matter of fact, the JNC8 report, even though they're recommending less than 150 over 90 for people between 60 and 79, they state that if you have a patient that's already treated to less than 140 over 90 without undue harm from their medications, you can continue treating them to less than 140 over 90. Pharmacists can do an awful lot. So one thing that they can do is they can advocate for patients through working with providers to provide interpretations of best available evidence and of these updated guideline recommendations. So we may have a slight difference in the exact blood pressure goal, but there's a lot of other recommendations there that advocate for selecting appropriate drug therapy. Matter of fact, one thing that's very different than previous JNC7 report or other guidelines is not listing beta blockers as first-line drugs for most patients. That's something new in both publications, and it's a message that pharmacists can actually help educate medical providers, whether they be physicians, nurses, physician assistants, we can actually help educate by explaining guidelines. And that's one universal difference that both publications agree on. Also, that can be involved in disease state management to help clinical practices improve global care for treatment of hypertension. For example, we have a plethora of data that's been published over the past five to 10 years, which evaluate pharmacist directed models of, of providing direct patient care. These models of pharmacists being involved with chronic diseases such as hypertension involve collaboration with physicians and other healthcare providers, but pharmacists really have get in the trenches and provide that direct patient care with patients. It's proven to improve achievement of goal blood pressure values and selection of medications. So pharmacists, in addition to educating providers, they can also provide some of the collaborative drug therapy management to improve disease control. Another role for pharmacists on impacting patient care is being involved with patient-centered medical homes. Many primary care practices and other ambulatory clinics have adopted a patient-centered medical home approach, which is really an integrated way to provide primary care and ambulatory care, which involves pharmacists working with nurses, working with providers such as physician assistants, nurse practitioners, and physicians to globally improve the care of populations. Hypertension is a great example of a disease where it's proven that pharmacists can help improve disease state control. And in, when being involved in these patient-centered medical homes, they can look at HEDIS measures and they can strive to improve those measures, which will tangibly relate to better medical payments and reimbursement rates for the practices involved. Another thing that I think is important to keep in mind is the role of adherence. 
C. Everett Koop, our former servant Surgeon General, said at one point, his quote was, medications work in patients that take them. So we know an awful lot about treating hypertension. We know the proven benefits of reducing cardiovascular events and cardiovascular death. But all this knowledge means nothing if our patients don't partner with us to actually become inherent with their treatments. So in summary, we have two publications to help guide our treatment choices. We have the JNC8 report and then we have the ASH guidelines, both published in 2013. We often fret over the differences between these guidelines, but let's really try to identify two things. One, the similarities in which there's strong advocacy for controlling hypertension as a primary modality to reduce cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. We also have four top tier drugs, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, calcium channel blockers, and Diurex, which are proven entities to treat hypertension and also to reduce the burden of hypertension. But also please remember that both these publications have a preamble. And the preamble is sort of a, you know, with caution interpretation. So even though both of these papers that are published, the JNC8 report and the ASH guidelines, they have some recommendations, one being evidence-based and ranked, that's the JNC8 report approach, and another one being a clinical practice recommendation guideline, that's the ASH guideline approach. We have a lot of information as clinicians that we can apply to our patients, but do remember that the preambles in both these publications state that guidelines are not rules, recommendations are not rules, and that clinicians must make patient-centered choices. Sometimes that patient-centered choice is a little different than the recommendations we read in these publications. So there should be good reasons to deviate from these recommendations because they overall are pretty well evidenced and well defended. But the clinician must make a prudent patient-specific choice based on the patient-specific presentation. If you would like more information, we are putting a link to the website for the Million Hearts Initiative in the description below.